student once again we are here to read about the age of pop that is from 1700 to 1745 was the age of pop though manners were coarse politics scandalously corrupt and the general tone of society brutal the england of the early 19th century witnessed a resolute attempt in the direction of moral regeneration as the reception recorded to collier's short view clearly proved people were fast growing sick of the outrageous license which in fashionable circles had followed the return of the stuarts and had begun once more to insist upon those elementary decencies of life and conduct which the preceding generation had treated with open contempt the desire for improvement is the, as we shall presently see a marked feature of not a little of the literature of this half century and especially of the literature which emanated from middle class writers who were of course not who were of course most strongly influenced by moral consideration but while revolting in this way against restoration profligacy the men of pop's era were quite as hostile as their fathers had been to everything that savored of puritan fanatism and religious zeal and thus the england now began to regain lost ground morally it did not recover the high passion or the spiritual fervor of the elizabethan age in their dread of those emotional excesses which to them seemed almost as monotorous as the moral excesses of the roisterers as roisterers they fell indeed into the mood of chilly apathy virtue was recommended and preached but a any manifestation of earnestness even in the pulpit pul- pulpit would have been regarded as dangerously suggestive of what was called enthusiasm and in shockingly bad taste good sense became the idol of the time and the good sense meant a lot of the reasonable and the useful and a hatred of the extravagant the mystical and a visionary this is shown in the field of religion in which the prevailing principle were rationalism and utility in the great district controversy which raged in england from the opening of the century of the death of bolingbroke in 1751 the dits or advocates of a purely natural religion kept up a persistent attack upon revelation and the miracle Cullus while far more noteworthy even then this is the fact that the orthodox defenders of christianity themselves were just as rationalistic in spirit as their opponents the assumption common to both parties was the supremacy of logic and reason it was the reason and to the good sense of their listeners that the greatest preachers appealed they sought not to satisfy the sluggish conscience through the feelings but to convince the intellect while on the whole region was conceived by them more as something necessary to the well-being of society like an effective system of police then as a power po- over the individual soul all the theological writings of the 18th century down to the beginning of wesley's evangelistic revival are characterized by the rationalistic and utilitarian temper the same temper marked the literature of the age which exhibit a similar coldness and want to feeling and a similar tendency towards solo west Shallowness in thoughts and formality in expression. It is a literature of intelligence. Of wit and of fancy, not a literature of emotion, passion or creative energy. And in it, spontaneity and simplicity are sacrificed to the dominant mania of elegance and correctness. This is true even of poetry, which seldom travel beyond the interest of that narrow world of the town 
by which man's outlook was commonly circumscribed and finding its public in the coffee house and drawing room drew for its substance upon the politics and discussions of the hour such poetry however clever was necessarily more or less fug fugitive it lacked inevitably the depth and the grasp of the essential things which alone assume permanence in literature and the quest for refinement in style resulted too often in stilted affectations and frigid conventionalism. The age of pop is sometimes called the classic age and the time sometimes the Augustan age of English literature. Neither of these terms can be commanded but they are so current that it may be well to explain the senses in which they should be understood. The epithet classic we may take to denote first that the poet and critics of this age believe that the work of the writer of classical antiquity presented the best of models and the ultimate standards of literature test and secondly in a more general way that like these Latin writers they had little faith in the promptings and guidance of individual genius and much in laws and rules imposed by the authority of the past. When 1706 Walsh wrote to Pope the best of the modern poets in all languages are those that have nearest copied the ancient, he expressed concisely the principle of the principle of classicism and this principle um, Pope himself reiterated in some well lines in a essay on criticism. The other epithet Augustan was applied in the first instant as a term of high praise because uh, those who use it really believed that uh, as the age of Augustus was the golden age of Latin literature so the age of Pope was the golden age of English literature. As this is not now our view, the original meaning of the word has disappeared but we may still employ it as a convenient catchword because it serves to bring out the analogy between the English literature of the first half of the 18th century and the Latin literature of the days of Virgil and Horace. In both cases, men of letters were largely depend upon powerful patrons, in both cases are critical spirit prevailed in both cases literature produced by a thoroughly artificial society was a literature not of free creative effort and inspiration but of self-conscious and deliberate art characteristic of classical school of poetry to understand the course of english poetry during the 19th century both along the main line represented by the work of augustans and their later adherents and along the various lines of reaction against their influence it is essential that we should have silence silence feature of the classical school clearly in mind though in the following epitome some repetition will be inevitable this will be justified by the importance of the subject as we have said classical poetry is in the man the product of the intelligence between with intelligence playing upon the surface of line on the other side emotion and imagination it is markedly deficient it is commonly detective satiric and poetry of argument and criticism of political and personalities it is almost exclusively a town poetry made out of interest of society in the great centers of culture the humbler aspect of life are neglected in it and it shows no real love of nature landscape or country things and people it is almost entirely wanting in all those elements which we rather vaguely sum up under the epithet romantic in the age of pop with its profound distrust of the emotions a hatred of the romantic in literature was logically accompanied of a hatred of enthusiasm in religion romanticism and enthusiasm alike cut across all its accepted notions of reason reasonableness and good sense the critical test of the time was distinctly unsympathetic toward the ruder masters of our older literature toward Chaucer for example and Spencer and even Shakespeare and it was especially hostile to everything that belonged to the middle ages with their 
Kaivalras extravagance, their visionary idealism and their strong religious faith. This critical antagonism to romantic literature and art is everywhere reflected in contemporary poetry. Extreme devotion to form and a love of superficial polish led to the establishment of the highly artificial and conventional style which presently became stereotyped into a regular traditional poetic diction. Classical embroidery of all kinds was employed in season and out of season till it was worn third bare and made ridiculous by constant use. Simplicity and naturalness disappeared before the growth of the false conception of refinement and grandiloquent phrases and prompter circ circumlocutions were substituted for plain and direct expression even when the matter dealt with was of the commonplace commonplace kind thus when the classic poet undertook to refashion the crude stuff of old ballad he translated the dawn right god raised his soul into the stilted eternal blessing on his shed attend and honestly thought that he was thereby turning a vulgar colloquialism into beautiful poetry. This is a good illustration of that gaudiness and in an phraseology against which Wordsworth was presently to enter his empathic protest. 5. Classical poetry adhered to the closest couplet as the only possible form of serious work in verse. The supremacy of the closest couplet should therefore be carefully noted. A little attention will show that an account of its epigrammatic terseness this form lent itself admirably to the kind of poetry that was the then popular, but it will be equally evident that in the long run it was bound to grow monotonous and that it was too narrow and inflexible to be made the vehicle of high passion or strong imagination. Pope's life Alexander Pope, the greatest master of the classical school, was born in London in 1688, the year of the revolution of Banyan's death. His father, a prosperous line named Draper, was a Roman Catholic and on account of his religious pope was excluded from the public school and universities. The result was that he picked up most of his knowledge in a haphazard way and though he read widely, he never became an accurate scholar and the, wa the want both of sound learning and of mental. Mental discipline, his apparent in his work extraordinarily precocious he published his pastorals in 1709 and his essay on criticism in 1711 he lived with his parents first at binfield on the skirt of windsor forest and then at chiswick till the completion of his translation of homer the financial success of which enabled him 1719 to buy a house in twickenham where there he passed the remainder of his life and there he died in 1744. Long regarded as the foremost man of letters of his day, he was petted and spoiled by admiring friends and might have enjoyed a far fuller need of general esteem than actually fell to his share but for the pity spitefulness of his nature, which perpetually turned friends into foes. As it is the history of his relations with his contemporaries, he is a tangled record of miserable jealousies and quarrels. Our judgment upon him must nevertheless be tempered by recognition of the fact that his extreme irritability and previousness were in large measure the, <coughs> measure the quen consequence of chronic illness, ill health. As he put it in epistle to Dr. Arbuthnot, his life was long disease. And despite his invalidism, he worked steadily almost to the last and with a sincere love of literature for its own sake, which is the more noteworthy because it was very rare at time. 
pops work pops poetic career falls quite naturally into three periods an early and a late of original work divided by a period 1715 to 25 of translation first to the period before 1715 along belong a number of miscellaneous poems of which the most important are four pastoral short poems on spring summer autumn and winter closely fashioned on virgil and in the most artificial manner of their class the messiha a poetic rendering of the messianic passage in isha in imitation of virgil's fourth eclogue the noble impressiveness of the original is quite lost in the meretarious glitter of pop's over Rot style when sore forest undoubtedly inspired by Dan Ham's Cooper's Hill in this it is easy to perceive the different in difference of the classic school to the real beauties of nature pop's landscape is copied out of greek and latin poets rather than painted from first hand knowledge of what he professes to describe the essay on criticism is which is certainly a very remarkable performance of a man of 21 it is not original in conception for it was inspired by horace ars poetica and boileau's el art poetic nor does it contain any fresh or independent thought for as lady mary wortley Mont- montago cruelly said it is all stolen but pop had read with some care and standard critics of the time especially the french critics and he puts the ideas he had gathered from them into wonderfully terse epigrammatic and quotable words the poem is of great interest as a popular interpretation of the literary creed of the age the rape of locke which may safely be called pop's masterpiece this was founded upon an incident which occurred in roman catholic society in which he had many friends a certain lord patry cut a lock of hair from the head of the young beauty named arabella former this practical joke led to a quarrel between the two families the and pop was appealed to by a common friend john carrel to throw while on trouble waters by turning the whole things into jest the rape of lock was the result pop defines the pop poem as heroi comical it is better to call it a mock epic in butler's uh, hody brass humorous matter had found ap- appropriate setting in rough doggerel's verse here on the contrary t- trivial occurrences and handled with all dignity and seriousness which properly belong to the epic this calculated and sustained discrepancy between them theme and treatment is of the essence of this particular kind of parody and effect is further supported by the arrangement of the plot upon the regular epic plan the employment of the supernatural machinery which every epic was supposed to require and the many passages in which scenes and praises from the great epics are directly imitated and burlesqued so burlesqued so admirably it is all this manage that the rap rap is the most perfect thing of its kind in our literature by the general flippancy of its tone and especially by its cynical attitude toward women it shows us meanwhile something of that fundamental closeness of feeling which the superficial glancery of pops as scarcely served even to will the translation of the iliad and the odyssey the former met single handed the latter with much help from others represent the labors of pop's second period this homer his homer as the two part are together popularly called has never ceased to be enjoyed and praised but it contains far more of pop than of homer he took up the task with a very meager equipment of his scholarship and had to depend much on formal translation but this advantage was slight the real difficulty lay in the fact that neither he nor his age could understand or enter into the spirit of homer or the homeric world his public however wanted neither a scholarly or a faithful version of greek poems but a readable drawing room rendering of them in accordance with the taste of their own time 
this pop gave them as given afterwards said his translation has every merit except fidelity to the original it is in fact not homer but a very striking and brilliant piece of 18th century work After the publication of his Homer, Pope confined himself almost wholly to satiric and didactic poetry. The principal works of this third period are satires and epistles of Horace imitated. The prologue to this, the epistle to Dr. Arbuthnot, is especially valuable as the most frankly personal of all Pope's writing. It contains, among other well-known passages, the famous character study of Edison under the name of Atticus, the Dunciard, a long and elaborate satire on the dunces, the bad poets, pedants, and pedantious critics of Pope's days. Epic machinery of this was obviously suggested by Dryden's MacFlecknow, but the inspiration is to be sought in Pope's innumerable quarrels with all sorts of people. While it is extremely clever, the utter obscurity of most of the dances attack destroys much of its point for the modern reader. The essay on man, a poem in four epistles in which Pope undertakes a defense of the moral government of the universe and the, an explanation of the physical and moral evil in it, on optimistic postulate that whatever is, uh, um, is right. Unfortunately, Pope was not a philosopher. He had no natural learning towards philosophy and no training for it. It was simply the influence of others and especially of his dis friend Lord Bolingbroke, which included him to dabble in it, and he certainly never thought out for himself the large and difficult questions with which he rashly set himself to, to deal. In consequence, the essay he hope, is hopelessly confused and self-contradictory, no one to do it. today therefore would dream of using it as it is. But, it contains many passages which are justly famous and are still often credited for their rhetoric beauty and power. Pope's merits and defects are those of classic schools. We can no longer regard him as great poet. His head, he had neither the imaginative power nor the depth of feeling without which great poetry is impossible, nor was he a great thinker. His view of life was the narrow and shallow view of characteristic of his age, but he was a very embodiment of kind of intelligence which was currently known as wit and which that as cultivated and admired. He was also within his limits and marvelously clever and adroit literary craftsman and the neat, compact, antithetic and epigrammatic style of writing which was classical ideal assumed perfection in his hands. After Shakespeare's he is the most frequently quoted of English poet and such familiar lines as these which are taken just as they come will suffice to show his extraordinary power of condensed and happy phrasing. He is also the most consummate master of the classic couplet which he trimmed of some of the license which Dryden had permitted himself, confining the sense more rigorously than ever within the two lines. Post perfected model was followed with Travis fidelity by all other poets who used the couplet till the early 19th century. Other poets of the period, I will here record the names of the more important verse writers who belonged. to Pope's generation and to his school. Consideration of several most interesting younger men, though a portion at least of their work falls within the limit of Pope's age, will be deferred to a later chapter because they represent the beginning of the change of taste. In point of time, Matthew Prerier tax precedence even of Pope himself. He came into notice as a man of 23 when he when he collaboration with Charles Montagu after Wars, Earl of Halifax, the Rot, a parody of Dryden's The Hind and the Panther, entitled The Town and Country Mouse. He afterwards produced an imitation of Hodribras called Alma and a long and very serious poem, Solomon. 
but uh, his light society verses which are not always very proper but are generally lively and gracefully uh, are the only portion of his work which now survive far better known than period john gay an intimate friend of swift and pop where wrote fables which still keep their place in anthologies a series of six pastoral the shepherd's week which though conceived in the spirit of burlesque are much truer to the facts of rustic life than the stream poster pastoral of pop trivia a humorous description of london street and travesty of the then immensely popular italian opera the beggar's opera we took the town by storm very different in character and genius was edward young a most contemptible person who wrote much in various style including satires in pop manners and tragedies but who long maintained a popularity far exceeding his desert as the author of night thoughts a gloomy and un- unwholesome poem full of copy book moralizing caused in florid and pro- pompous verse but with occasional passages of undeniable power one point about it is historical significance like another sober production of the same churchyard school the grave by a scotch poet robert blair it is written not in the prevailing classic couplet but in blank verse a descriptive poem the chairs by william somerville 1692 in is another early specimen of the same form the mock heroic the dispensary of sir samuel garth a satire on the society of apothecaries has little interest for us now but it may be mentioned as an illustration of the taste of the time this is all about the age of pop that is section verse now we will read on on next video thank you for supporting and keep supporting like share and subscribe this channel